Okay, so, so let's turn it around on you. On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 meaning your day couldn't be worse. I'm not going to ask you how focused and present your energy is. But on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 couldn't be any worse, 10 couldn't be any better. Just throw me some numbers so I can gauge the environment because I'm just getting to meet you all tonight. 8, 8, 8.5, okay. <laughs> when I do these and I do the, the emotional check-in with audiences, I've, I don't know if I've ever had anybody give me other than a solid number, so something different. Well, this is my chapter, kind of, because when I got certified six years ago, I'm coming up on renewal again at the end of this month, the ICF said, what chapter? And you had to fill it out. So I, so I said, Chicago. They go, great. So I've been. Do any of you know or did know Christine Gilmore? Yeah. She, was the, she, she saw me uh, when I did my second class. It was here in Chicago. Um, I was struggling. I was struggling, and I was ready to give it up. David Darth was our instructor, and he saw me and helped me. But Christine reached out because she, she shared with me. She went through the same struggle. And we formed a relationship. She coached me for a, a, a while. And it was great. And, and she said, oh, I'm so excited to hear you doing this. But I've moved to Portland, so I can't see you. Do any of you know Susan Valdeseri? Yep. Yes. Okay. IBMer. She was an IBMer. She was a fellow coach with me there. She was the one who was the host for my very first class that we contracted with CTI. And um, Rick Tamlin was our instructor with her. And she made me feel very welcome. And I got to know her, but she's not here either. <laughs> And we talked a lot of Notre Dame because her dad was the sports information director at Notre Dame for a number of years and highly respected. All right. Who likes apples? Who are the apple people in here? Orange people more than apples. Any orange people? No orange people? Got to have an orange person or you blows my whole intro. Well, <laughs> how many... Really? No more orange people? Are there any orange people? All right, we got some. All right. Well, if you didn't know this, that the universe has, has come up with some new research that oranges really like oranges, and apples really like apples. So if we think that all life extends from a central place and concept, we all grow like apples and oranges, and we can be like apples and oranges, and we, if we're an apple, we like apples. And if we're an orange, we like oranges. And if we get a client, if we're an orange, we get a client that's an orange, they, we just sometimes hit it off, and apples hit it off with apples. Um, what I have found, and I am not a master coach by any means, but what I have found is, over the years, and I learned this experientially, and I learned it a bit intuitively as I was going through a lot of things earlier in my life and career and things like that, that trust really works, really works. I didn't get that through training. I didn't get that through some credential. I got that by working with people and trying to work even with oranges, because I'm an apple person too. And so trust is the most important part of any coaching I do. Trust is the most important part of any engaging that I do, whether it be at, I, at IBM with leaders. And today, I was with a group. <laughs> Susan, and I'll talk about Susan, was part of bringing coaching more into IBM. And we are on the cusp of taking it to being a business. We have a new initiative underway by an executive called Entrepreneurship, Building a Business Within a Business. And they found out about us, and we're pitching it next month. And we've actually got the CEO's speechwriter. He brought this person in to help us present our thing because he said, I, I think you've got a good idea here, and I want it to be successful. But as I was talking with this person that helped, I tried to build trust with this person. Not necessarily, yes, intentionally, but not because it was a forced intention, but because that's become part of my paradigm, my framing. And the one thing I got back, as we were talking through numbers, IBM's all about numbers and business, you got a business cases, he says, I do like your energy. 
And the energy was not just me, but the energy drew this person in. There might have been a little law of attraction. There might have been, maybe this person was an apple person as well, whatever. But there was something that drew them in. And I've seen this over and over and again. And if, co if trust is part of the space, any space with a person, and there are different kinds of spaces, and especially if it gets into that interpersonal space, which if it's person to person, it's about two feet. So as I was introducing myself to everybody, I was actually doing a little, some of you, I came in a little closer. I tried to get in that two foot space and I tried to observe. Am I intruding or am I okay? And it's, there's no wrong answer in that. Excuse me, there's no wrong answer in that. But it's part of trying to build my experience with people and with strangers and different dynamics. Because I also coach high impact presentations. I am not God's gift to speaking, but I coach high impact presentations at IBM. And right now I'm working with an executive who has been chosen to do a TED talk. Already a very accomplished speaker, very accomplished speaker, but they've been, and the person who wanted coaching around it decided to go inside the company rather than externally. Also decided to spend not as much money as the thousands of dollars you would get. And what the person wants is that nuanced presence. And we've talked about the space that even though you're with your audience, it'll be like this, and who knows what, you know, where or how that will be. I don't know that environment. I said, but you want to build the space so that as you talk to them, it's almost as if you're leaning in. And if they're not going to lean back, don't intrude. But if they lean in, then you have a chance to make a connection. And oh my gosh, if an apple and an orange can make a connection, what can be accomplished? Juice. Juice. Oh, the juice. The juice. Uh, ju yeah. And I'd also say magic can happen. Magic can happen. And more, and with clients, you can have more apples to apples. And sometimes where the client does less telling, about apples, let's talk about apples, when the real big A agenda is the orange. Because along with the trust is the intimacy. Let me give you two stories. I recently did, about three weeks ago, an employee retreat. It was for some burned out social workers. And it was in, in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I was down there with them. And I brought in some coaching techniques, did the wheel and some things. And then also I'm certified in uh, wellness inventory and do wellness coaching. And so I always like to get a, uh, do a demo if I have an opportunity to, so they can experience it viscerally. Not just the person, but the whole group, rather than just something um, you know, linear. And so I, I, I don't, I've, I've been more lucky than good, I guess. I've always gotten a volunteer, even when I'm on the phone. I get volunteers. So I got this volunteer who happened to be an ex-professional football player, ex-professional football player. And on break, after we had established some trust and intimacy, and I was, I just looked and I said, social work? And, he, and you know, because I had trust and intimacy, he knew I wasn't making criticism, and he said, yeah, that's always what I wanted to do. I didn't want to be a pro football player. It provided a lot of money, and I got through college free, but I wanted to be, I want to help people. And so, um, it was great. So this was the person that stepped forward. But when he stepped forward in volunteering, what he brought in was, I'm just going to help be the model here for everybody because he's a leader. And this guy had muscles on his muscles. I mean, I, I t when he we got done, I tapped on his shoulder. And oh my gosh, I'd never felt anybody that cut before. But he stepped forward. And as we were talking, his discussion points, well, his topic was better choices. It's great. I only had like 10 minutes. And so we got the topic. He was articulate. He was intelligent, the whole bit. But he was going to kind of demonstrate how this was going to go. But his topic was better choices. Well. Through the trust that got built with a stranger in a situation where he was asked to volunteer, or I didn't ask him, but I asked the group and he said, I'll do it. We established enough trust that the, the reasons that he said why he didn't make better choices, he said they're reasons, they turned out to be excuses. They turned out to be excuses. And through that, the client got the aha for himself that these are excuses, not reasons. And... Then, he then went on something else. But what trust allowed, the trust that got built, was the disclosure. The trust allowed him to be vulnerable, allowed him to be believing that the space was safe. And there were three kinds of spaces. There was me and him, and then there was the outer group, and then there was the level three environment. And managing it can be a challenge, but he believed me that this is not play for me. We are really coaching here, and I am focused on you, and I want to really, if you bring me a real topic, I'll give you the best coaching I can give you in this 10 minutes. And so he said, put up or shut up, kind of. He gave a real topic, and we went for it, and it did. 
and, and it was great. But the trust allowed the disclosure. Second one, I said I do wellness coaching. I'm doing some right now. And I have a client who's in uh, one of the top five law firms in the country who has, is a little older, has diabetes, overweight, and can't keep up with the stress level of a corporation like that. And I get that. That's part of the reason I got matched with the person. And so the client was saying, you know, part of my problem is maybe I'm just too hard on myself. Well, what trust brought into space was where the client felt safe enough, but enough trust with the interaction that the truth that got shared is, it isn't that I'm too hard on myself. There's self-hatred going on. Oh, does that change the tenor of the coaching? Does that change the topic? Does that allow the client to explore things within themselves? Within themselves. Let's look at what the experts say, because I think trust and intimacy is better built if there is a designed alliance. If, and I know that's fundamental, but at, what I found is that after coaches get their credential or get their experience, even if they don't go for the certification, we kind of get away from the fundamentals. We, we bi either build them in uh, where it becomes part of our paradigm and our frame, or we get away from them with, with our model that works. And so I'm big on fundamentals. I, I, don't, I don't assess every client. I don't have a three-month minimum contract. I have a contract. I have an agreement. I follow the... But I don't... I, 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 I show up and I let the client show up. There's homework. There's a lot of structure sometimes. But it's, it's also open and free. But I think fundamentals are important to know. So to me, a designed alliance, and there are different ways to define it, but I got that term from CTI. That's where I did my, what I call my accredited or undergraduate uh, coach training. And I went looking, and there's no, I didn't find a definition for designed alliance. So I took design, and I took, the, took alliance, and I looked at those. So if you look in the dictionary, there are several definitions to choose for design. And the one that I like, is intelligent, purposeful, or discoverable pattern. Intelligent, purposeful, or discoverable pattern as opposed to chaos. Now, coaching is messy. And when the mess shows up, sometimes that's the best coaching because when the client is, is letting things loose, sometimes it's a little out of control. They're out of their comfort zone. They're risking. They're, 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 they're trusting the coach enough to risk with the coach and let the coach into that. Oh, wow. But it isn't fully chaos. There is a method to the madness, and that's what sometimes the coach does, hold the method. But I like this definition. And then alliance is in a union, coalition, or formal agreement between parties in their common interest. I like, I like that definition. And then I took them, design and alliance, and I put them together. So to me, designed alliance is a purposeful agreement for common interest. A purposeful agreement for common interest. Now, I said I think fundamentals are important, and coaches sometimes get away, so I've got some exercises that are optional. I, I do uh, things for my clients, and I say, this one's optional, but this one, if you want me to earn my money's worth with you, you really ought to do. It'll support what you say you want to do. So if we're tired, our energy may be up. If we're tired, you don't have to do this this long. But I'm just going to go through the Code of Ethics from the ICF. Section 3, professional conduct with clients. So even though it's messy, even though it's messy, and it needs to be an open, safe place, there is structure. And sometimes apples love structure. And sometimes oranges don't like structure, but they wish there were a little more structure. They sometimes wish they were a little more like apples. And apples sometimes go, man, I like to be a little more free like the, the orange. And, and they're, everybody talks about their grape juice, and we get rotten sometimes. <laughs> so Section 3 of the ICF standards say there should, be a, there should be clear agreements or contracts. Agreements or contracts. This, if you've been certified uh, through the ICF, this is what the Code of Ethics say we should be doing as coaches. Clear agreements or contracts. Understand the nature of coaching. Do we understand the nature of coaching? And does the client kind of understand what it is that they've signed up for? And then along with clear agreements or contracts and understand the nature of coaching, then under those agreements, there are terms. Terms of the coaching agreement or contract. So you have, a, you have an agreement, but what about the terms? What about the terms? And when I do my intake 
I spend time going over this thing, these things with the client, but I use them to help foster more trust. It isn't just me telling them what, you know, we got this agreement, point, boom, boom, boom. I say, okay, do you have a problem with that one or is that anything uncomfortable? Because at the beginning, I haven't established, as, I've established enough that we're starting, but I haven't sta established enough that we're going. So I probably spend more time designing the alliance, not just through the intake session, but more time building that relationship than later. Uh, what I have found is that pay me now or pay me later is a pretty good uh, adage to go by, and an investment up front will pay dividends later. I've been the president of three nonprofits, and a couple of them were startups. And in um, one of them, uh, I helped lead the effort to craft the vision and mission. And oh, the poor board, we spent so much time, so much time. But when we got that done, and everybody embraced it, and, the, and there was, and I used some coaching to allow everyone to have free say and felt like part of it and participate and voice or not voice, but free to do that. We never revisited it in the, in the years we had it uh, later. And so I think the same, I, I found the same thing here when I designed this alliance with the client that has the trust and intimacy built into it, but when we have these things in place built on trust and intimacy, not just on my methodology, we don't revisit them because they, tr they trust then that it makes sense and it doesn't take away. But if something were to come up, because I'm open and flexible, we have enough trust and intimacy, we will discuss it. But I do have an agreement. And then the client has the right, I, I, I just believe this, and I'm glad it's in the ethics, to terminate the coaching relationship. Terminate, and I'm glad ICF says relationship. It doesn't say contract. It, it, it would be terminating the agreement or contract. And you may have that in your terms. And that's okay. I'm not judging anything. I'm just saying I'm bringing in what the ICF says, but I like what it says because I think it helps reinforce what I'm trying to uh, build as far as conceptually trust and intimacy and then somehow making enough of a connection that whether you agree or disagree or whatever, it's that I made enough of a connection that in some point something got through so you could make a, a conscious decision. Okay, then uh, right to terminate and alert to the client no longer benefiting from the coaching. No longer benefiting. When, when I was with this couple and I was rushing and we were getting done because we had spent a uh, sample session, well, it was with a couple, because I was doing, uh, I've been coaching this one person, and now this IBMer wanted to bring their spouse in. I've not, this is my first couple's coaching. And it's not marital, it's coaching, because they both have desires and the race and all that stuff. And so I'm, I'm, I'm having to get to the meeting and that, and we got all done, and they're saying, oh, have, have a great meeting, and da, da, da. And I remember, and I go back, and I go, I said, now look, one thing I forgot to say, if, 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 that you don't feel, after we've gone through this, you have a good understanding of what this coaching is and what we'll do and that stuff, and you have, you have your questionnaire that'll help dive into your values and things like that. But if you don't if think it's going to be a fit, you don't think coaching is going to be a value, or you don't think I'm going to be a fit, I'm not going to be offended. Let me know that you don't even want to start. I, just, just let me know, but I won't be offended. So terminate it on, on the front end. So client no longer benefiting, we should be alert to that. And sometimes when clients grow, maybe they need another different kind of style. Maybe they've gotten enough from the orange coach and they need an apple. I don't know. I don't know. Um, so it maybe encourage the client to make a change if better served. Encourage client to make a change if better served. And even suggest the services of other professionals as appropriate. I've done that and I've had referrals. I've done that, and great for my marketing when I get a referral, great for the business, but oh my gosh, I've built enough trust with another peer professional that they feel confident enough to refer, and they, that client that hopefully they care enough about that they want to get good service, that trusts them enough to check it out, it, it just, it's a domino thing. It's a, whole, it's a whole village concept, so to speak. All right, so there are the ethics. ICF, we also have competencies. So we set the foundation. With competencies. In IBM, we, in our careers, we start, we focus on 
making some personal business commitments we have to do, and we have to have skills to accomplish those. So skills is anywhere. You've got to have skills, and you have to demonstrate competency with that. But beyond the skills and the competency of the skills, you have to have competencies, other competencies, that you can take anywhere. So I think uh, what I found is coaching competencies can undergird a any kind of profession, any kind of profession. I have taught on the community college level. If you're in Indiana, you'd know who Ivy Tech is. It's not, but it's one of the largest in the country. I've been there 29 years. And I am not an educator. My, whole, my family is, but I was not. Uh, teaching I can do, but I'm not, I was not the greatest. So I, I came in and did it. And when I got certified, or when I was going through my training as certified, I thought, I wonder if this would work in the classroom. So I took coaching. I'm going to take coaching into the classroom. Rather than just be, just collectively build this. I'm taking coaching. So I thought, oh, here's a great place. I mean, I, I can, I'm not uh, the most intellectual person, but I can think on my feet a little bit. So I, I, I thought, oh, here's a great place. Let me try a question. And let me try this. And pretty soon it was like, as I asked the question, I have to answer the answer. And the answers were great. So I started listening, listening. Started listening more. I started engaging more. Started asking more. I started connecting more. And my students, I've got, they keep inviting me back. I keep telling every class, you can be the class that keeps me coming back if you don't find value. I don't want to be here if I don't bring you value. But they kept giving good feedback, and I get that back. So in 2012, the, uh, they asked me to speak at the statewide adjunct. I'm an adjunct. I just teach my marketing class. One semester. They asked me to speak to the statewide adjunct faculty on, uh, on connecting in the classroom. Because I had done it in South Bend, uh, they said, you get really good results. We got a lot of new instructors. Could you do something on what works for you? So I did on connecting, and then they had this day. So I spoke down there to, on connecting in the classroom. And the same kind of competencies can be there. So understand what is required. It, it builds off of the the, the ethics, but understand what is required to set the foundation with the client. To me, it's trust and intimacy. That to me is one of the requirements, but what is required? Agreement over process and relationship with the client, client with the coach, and match between method and client needs. I like methods. I like process. I'm trained in process management, project management, strategic planning. I love process and management. I'm an ex-Marine, IBMer. I can process all day long. I can do actions all day long. But relationship, it's process and relationship. It's method and client needs. It's a balance. Agreement over those things with the client. Match between. But I think they need some discovery. I think they need some discussion because the client is, well, you tell me. I came to you. You're the expert here. How do we do this coaching thing? And then, you know, we dance in the moment. I don't talk about that. I mean, I do, I bring up these terms later. I, oh, what we're doing now is something I call, we call dance. Oh, dance in the moment. That's kind of cute. <laughs> you know, matter of fact. But it's process and relationship, method and client needs. And then co-creating relationship. ICF says the competencies in establishing that relationship and establish that co-creation is a safe, supportive environment, safe environment, for the coach as well as the client. It's a relationship. And then trust then intimacy and ongoing mutual respect. And when there is trust and when there's intimacy with anyone, there will be some kind of mutual respect. And in a relationship where there's contracts and the other things, the foundation set, it'll be ongoing. It'll be ongoing. Because no one gets to be wrong. I do use that one. No one gets to be wrong. <coughs> and the only way I can really help you the most is if we talk and you disclose. And if I'm wrong, then you've got to just let me know. But I will use instinct and intuition. And that is also a skill, that is also a competency that does get honed. That's, a, that's an intangible, that's a nebulous one. I, I, I didn't take a class for that, but intuition is part of what I use. And I find out, you know what? I'm not an intuit, but I have honed some intuition. And I use that. And if there's trust and, response, and, trust and intimacy, the client doesn't confuse me and, and hold me back. They sometimes go, yeah. Thanks. I needed you to say. I mean, I had somebody once that had, had talked about coaching, talked about coaching, talk, and I said the person's name. I, I could say the first name because you wouldn't know him, but I feel like if I say the name, I'm violating the confidence. So I'm not going to miss the first name. But I said, are you asking me to coach you? Yes, thank you. 
So it, has, it, it, it comes out. It needs to come out. And then show genuine concern for the client. Genuine concern. Being authentic. Modeling. Um, being vulnerable. That, those are tough. Especially in, a, in an IBM environment. Those are tough. But I found it works there too. I found it works there too. And so, the, the IBM and executives, the higher you go, the more it's like you have to know everything. And everybody leans on you. And you got to know everything. And, and you're type A. And you're everything. And, 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 and outcome management. And what do I got to do? And how do I handle these problem children? That's all the coaching topics. But when they find out they can be a whole person there too, oh my gosh, the weights that get, li the weights that get lifted, the weights that get lifted, and, and, and you show concern for them and they believe it because it's authentic, and you're even building trust with them. And even if they're, in, oh my gosh, I, 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 you know, manager, I love leaders, but managers that are, are, are beyond the lid, beyond their leadership level, and are in all kinds of ego, all that kind of stuff, they really, they're typically, they really rub me the wrong way. But when they come in as a client, I put all that aside, try really hard, and because I find out they are really real people, and they really, um, they want a place where it can be safe. And, they come back, and it, it just changes the whole thing. Um, so genu showing genuine concern for clients, then demonstrating personal integrity. Championing new behavior and risk taking. And if, I believe if there is not trust in that relationship, it will be much more difficult to champion risk taking. New behaviors, maybe they, if they, you can, you know, you try to get them left brain if they're if they're engineering or whatever. You try to get them to understand it um, intellectually, but taking that risk out of the comfort zone, having to be vulnerable, uh uh, you can talk about it. So again, trust and intimacy and where it's been experienced, where it's real, because of engineering concern. Uh, they will be more apt to, to want to do it because they know, you know what, I don't have to play Lone Ranger here. Um, you're going to be with me. You're going to be right there with me. And they know it's not my life, it's yours. But yeah, I'll be there with you going through it. And thank you, client. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mrs. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Miss. Thank you for inviting me into your life. Thank you for sharing something so personal and so important to you. And it comes across genuine. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting um, tapped into some of that experience that I remember because that has happened. That's how I can tap into that. And that's why I love this because when that happens, it's what I call the magic. It's the magic. And it's, it's the most magic experience almost anywhere. In Designing Alliances, again, create a safe and courageous space. Safe and courageous. Establish client trust. Set the stage for the client. Set the stage for the client. Safe and courageous space. Client trust. Set the stage. Just reinforcement of what the ICF says. I believe I, I believe CTI does it because it makes sense that the ICF says so, but also that's what I picked up from my instructor. That's what I picked up in those demos. That's what I picked up when they said, Mark, come be the volunteer. Oh my gosh. They <laughs> better it needs to be real safe. And then questions, dog or coaches, questions, powerful questions, okay? You know, but, but really, how do you want me to coach you? That, that, that's a real question. How do you want me to coach you? They, and they got to be saying how they really want you to coach them rather than impression management. Where, uh, okay, I want, I don't want to, I want him to ask me an question questions so I can tell him how much I know about my life. Maybe. Because he's this certified coach. If this coaching were to impact, what would it look like? Yes? What do you say when someone says, I want you to tell me what to do? <laughs> Have you had that happen? Mm -hmm. When did that, did it happen at the beginning, in the beginning? In the, oh, when does yeah, that come I, up? I would say it usually happens the first time they get into a, I can't make up my mind place. Right. And they say, I wish you could just tell me, and I go, but you know I, that's not what I do, or you know, right. make some some crack. But so then they usually know I'm not going to tell them. Right. But it's interesting that almost every client always says that somewhere. Am I making you nervous by walking closer? No. Okay. But we'll keep the table safe because you don't know what I do if I come around it. <laughs> so let's just say, Kathy, you're my client, and I'm the coach here. Okay. What makes you ask me that question? 
you mean just now? Let's say you're, that's your real question. Let's say you're my client and that's your real oh, question. Oh, and I'm saying, okay, uh, why don't you tell me what to do? What makes you ask me that? Well, because I can't make up my mind. About what? Uh, about whatever we're talking about. Okay. Is it important to you to know and important for me to tell you? It's important for me to make a good choice. Good choice? That's pretty good, isn't it? I've got to have more time. Could we take, could we put that aside and take more time and build this and go this way? If you really want to explore that right now, I will. But could we put that aside right now and explore? Because I want to get to know you better. I want to get you to know me better. And we will get that answer. And it'll come out, but it will have a higher quality if we hold okay, that aside. So you're talking about that early on when you're still creating all Yeah, I try to put it in the parking lot. Okay. But I also try to tell you kind of, if that were a real discussion, I, I try to have the client be part of the decision in is it okay to put it on the parking lot? That's my suggestion as part of the relationship. But if they're not buying into that, then I gotta find out where they do buy into it. Because if I step over that and they want to answer, they're gonna be distracted and they're gonna be hung up with that first. I mean I just gotta make sure that what's behind that you know and, and of course right, we're not gonna get an answer. It's not by it's not three meetings and it you know, no, no but I was also talking about when they when you're asking them um, how you want to be coached. So they could say, well, if, you know, when I get stuck, I want you to tell me or something, and that's part of the clarification process, right? So, right. Um, I also believe the coaching 2.0 model, I don't know, you might be in 2.0, 2.5 or 3.5, that I believe sometimes it's okay to wear multiple hats. Sometimes you can be the mentor. Sometimes you can be the instructor. Sometimes you can be the consultant. Sometimes you can be the And sometimes, now this is stretching a little bit, I'm not the parent, but you take on the role Taking a little different role, but it's, it gets very clear if you're doing it because otherwise you violate the ethics. And I, when my sample sessions, when I'm explaining coaching, and I do these circles. This represents you. This represents your goal. This represents the mod modality you could use to reach the goal. The triangle. And over here, you've got mentor, manager, consultant, counselor, instructor, facilitator, therapist, even parent. They will tell you how to reach that goal. I do mentor. I'm free mentor. I'll tell if you want to learn. Uh, how to make a better presentation and, and do something like that, I'll tell you how to do it, how you do it. But coach is focused on you, and I do believe that. The coach is focused on the client, and it's a different modality than these others. But sometimes they, the, the person that's been at IBM two or three years, they go, Mark, please, I want, and I'm doing career coaching? You got, you won the IBM Leadership Award? You're demonstrating it? I'm here. I want to know what the 35-year IBM affects. So the coaching hat kind of but now the experienced mentor has to say, okay, look, here's what I've done. But it's, but it's clear. It's just putting those things in clarity. But early on, I tried to put that in my parking lot. But she would say, you know, how, how would you like me to coach? How would you like me to be with you as your coach? That's that role. Um, do you want, and she would say, let's modulate it. Let, when you, let me know when you want more of something or less of something. Let's modulate it because it's not, there's not a static way that's going to be every single time. She believes in intuition. That's where I first heard that. And, and it kind of stuck with me because I respected her. And she really presented herself very nice that first class. So I paid a lot of attention. And she's right. I use intuition too. I wish you were here to hear me say, Susan, I first heard you say it. It kind of, uh, I like what you said about it. And it stuck with me. Uh, she says the relationship will be messy at times. That's for sure. Always feel free to tweak the coaching. Tweak the coaching. I've had coaching where uh, we were going to meet for an hour every week, and then for various reasons, because most of my clients like the way I do it, I say, we don't have to have a schedule, why don't we send it to go? We got done, when do you want to meet next? Well, give me some homework, I need some time. Or I got a vacation coming up, or I know this is a good problem, so let me get back to you. No problem. And I know some of my methodology might be a little too loose to champion the client that might waffle, but this is how I do it. But for the client that wants to have it set, when, it, when, it, when it's like, Something's not right here. I go, okay, let's stop and talk about it. Let, let's put the agenda aside for a moment and talk about what's, what's showed up that you're disclosing with me. And what, we, what happens is that the structure the client has to have, because I, especially at IBM, it's meeting scheduled, got to do the meeting, got to accomplish this by the end of the quarter, da da da. That isn't working for now, this whole person concept, depending on, on the topic item. So we then go, then we go, well, let's explore this. Okay, what else could we do? You know, uh, what else could we do? Well, I don't know. Some meetings. I, I, this every week. I'm liking it, but uh, 
I go, well, maybe the structure. Maybe let's not meet every week. Remember when we first met and I said, I could schedule two ways. If you need to have a meeting at a certain time, I will accommodate that if I can't. And you said you did, and we did. But now it sounds like it's not working for you. So remember I said we could just schedule this as we go? So we'll do that. And then, yeah, 45. Could we do a half an hour? Laser sessions, I do those all the time. They work great for busy part of people. And we kind of get right into it. And if there's trust and intimacy, we don't need to do it. We just so um, tweak the agreement, uh, tweak the coaching. Agree to let each other know if we aren't finding value in the relationship. Will I be able to challenge you more? Speak hard truths, field work, homework, and what else do you need from me as your coach? Um, Sarah Smith. Sarah Smith was our first professional certified coach in IBM, as far as I know. Um, an executive by the name of Jane Cresswell, who has her own coaching practice, brought coaching into IBM, was very well received. Well, that's how we got the contract goal in CTI, right? Training later, it, it got squelched. But um, Sarah, with Susan, helped, and some others, helped take the coaches and form the IBM coaching network, became a little more official, and then Sarah helped establish the IBM coaching community of practice. Uh, that's now with almost 500 members worldwide, and the, <laughs> they, they, I, I was just on the outside soaking it up, but when they found out I taught marketing, and, and my first coaching was with co entrepreneurs, helping them with marketing their business, and putting a marketing plan together, stuff like that. So they found out, hell, help us! So I got pulled into leadership, and then um, when Sarah left, and Susie Good, and uh, some other stuff, um, Stacey Gorham was a coach out east, and she took over the leadership, and, and then she left in May to take a full-time executive coaching position at Ernst & Young, and she called me and said, Mark, I want you to sit in my chair. So I now lead with three others, because I changed it from a single person, or corporate, it was another person, go to this strategic leadership team of four of us, but um, leading, leading this team, and um, Susan, Sarah, Jane Cresswell, and I talked to Jane, and it was great uh, that I said, you know, I'm interested in leaving a legacy and continuing your legacy. She thought that was really great, and we may have another opportunity to do that. But Sarah says, like this, in traditional relationships, there is an implied imbalance of power based on roles, such as manager and employee roles, coach and athletes in that context, and parent and child. But a designed alliance assumes that people are full participants with equal power, equal power equal power. And if there's equal power, then both can be empowered. I have a table. Now, I am not, as, a, as I am not an artiste, I'm not the greatest PowerPoint user. Rocky could have probably done this totally dimensional and with nice shading and high tech and probably have flames coming out of the areas as I moved, but I got it done. <laughs> so we have these here. So in the German, we have the uh, horizontal axis represented by self, and the vertical axis represented by others. And so we have these boxes where we have this open free area. It's called open free because whatever's in there is known to ourselves and known to others. Blind area, known to self, but uh, I mean unknown to self, known to others. The hidden area, known to self, unknown to others. And the unknown area, um, unknown to self and unknown to others. So, back to quadrant one, the open and free area. This is a space where good communication and cooperation occur. Probably there's a lot of trust and trusting that there can be intimacy. That, that, that probably helps that area work that way. Quadrant two, this blind area is not an effective or productive space for individuals. Things are known to others, but unknown to self. I've been married 45 years. And I have matured and grown and become more self-aware and more emotionally intelligent. So I learned to start listening to my wife. She is not verbose and want the center. She's very practical, very smart. She has talents. Uh, things. So I started listening to her. 
and we laugh because I do listen to her, which encourages her. So she will say, when we're when I'm talk, I get so excited about coaching, it's excited stuff. I'll talk to people we're at dinner or something, somebody I know comes up, and we'll get done and leave. She'll go, Mark, you interrupted that person three times. Wow, why are you interrupted that person? Oh, I'm so excited. You interrupted, but you interrupted. Well, they know me and they didn't take it that way, I don't think. How do you know? <clears throat> so I have a blinder. <laughs> but I do, I get excited. I get excited. Now I do self, and I, I do admit I self manage myself, my clients, and I'm able to really do that, but not all the time. And if she were here, oh, well, she would add on. Okay. <laughs> Quadrant three is this hidden area. Um, anything that a person knows but does not reveal, does not reveal. I believe coaches do modeling for clients. I believe that before they can embrace, I mean. There are ways to accomplish their goals. And sometimes tools are good, models are good, evidence-based practices are good. They bring results. They give the client what they need. Uh, I like the free form. I like the messy. I like the dance in the moment. But I also, methodology sometimes is what a client is paying for and wants. It wants. So if we model what we're trying to get the client to be more self-aware of, do we have to show intimacy first or vulnerability first or show a foible first, I don't know, or, or model something that's very authentic, but it's kind of like, what do you think here? I, I think that would be the greatest risk a coach could take because those roles are supposed to be equal power according to ICF and CTI, but there is still this implied the coach is the expert, the client is the different coach. If the coach shows something that might be hidden, hidden, hidden of themselves even. I mean, it says known, but it's hidden. And they share that, that's appropriate to service client. I wonder what that would do for the relationship. Would it blow it apart because it was too much? Or would it, would it unlock that door that the client didn't have courage to do? I don't know. I throw it out there. I'm still working on my blinder. And then quadrant four. Quadrant four. Toughest one. Unknown to self, unknown to others. Um, this is where therapy could be needed because this could be because there are repressed or subconscious feelings rooted in formative, formulative events and traumatic past experience which can stay unknown for a lifetime. And if we unlock those as a coach, depending on what we unlock, if you don't have training in that, uh, I don't know if that would do it. So, so that, that's a scary area. That's a scary area. I think it really takes some professional expertise to be able to deal with some of that. But be that as it may, um, things are often repressed, and as, as excited as we get for the client, um, if we play therapist, when we're not, when we need the therapist, are we doing them into service? So, you know, get all excited and say, be careful, that's just Mark. Some of you may go, I, Mark, I can help you know how to handle that. Maybe you could. Uh, I'll give the Animation Factory credit for this PowerPoint, my apples and oranges. Now you don't have to do this one now, but you'll 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 like this. You'll like this. You'll like this. Because you can do it now, or you can take it with you and do it later. If you throw it away, oh, some of them, the color didn't do good on the printer. I should say take from the bottom. So if you got one you don't like the color, you'll find another one that's better. But I was too cheap to print out more. And I kept one of the ones without the good color. So this is oh this is a wellness wheel. So coaching, this is the wheel. So in my wellness training, we have a wheel. So I have a license and it, it has an inventory tool the clients take to rate it and then they get a website where it shows their scores and their motivations and, and then they can do action plans, journal, all kinds of tools, stuff and the coach can make. It's really, really cool. Um, and I'm working with this one client using this tool. If we even though we're coaches and we're trying to take care of them. If we take care of our, so now, step out of the coach role, just be a person. If we take care of ourselves, we'll build more trust and intimacy with people. We will build. And so these, so the coaching wheel are cuts on um, parts of our life. Parts of our life, career, romance, fun, health, that kind of stuff. This um, is, um, John Travis is, is one of the founders of wellness, this concept. These are the dimensions of a person's life. 
there, there could be others, but these are basically the 12 dimensions. And all the dimensions are built on the first one, the self-responsibility and love. This is where it starts setting the context and the philosophy that it's about self, taking responsibility for ourselves, to love ourselves more. We will then show love to others. So self-responsibility. Breathing are one of the three inputs in the system. Breathing, oxygen. You know, so like I said, an interpersonal ex uh, do an intrapersonal exercise, talk with yourself, how you doing, do I like myself, that kind of stuff. When, you know, how's your breathing? How's your breathing? Have you taken any deep cleansing breaths? If any of your yoga instructors or, or take yoga, talk to those people, they would tell you about breathing. Uh, people that do sensory type coaching and stuff like that. Anybody do somatic coaching? Breathing would be part of part of that. That'd be something. So breathing. Sensing, you know, my gosh, God's gift. The eyes that we can see. Some people are kinesthetic and love to touch. Smells. Feeling the wind on my face. I, I walk two or three times a week to get out holistically. That's why I wanted to get wellness. I wanted my practice more holistic. So I like sensing. Hearing. Hearing. Eating. That's a second input. Breathing is an input into our system. Eating is another. Moving. It doesn't say exercise. Exercise is a form of moving. But moving is... Um, is uh, There are other kinds of just, just exercise. Feeling and thinking. Now, thinking is the other kind of system input, according to this, but I think thinking and feeling are so close, and if you do any uh, NLP or neuroscience, um, the research is coming out about the brain, that you know we have this prefrontal cortex, which is where you make the decisions and do the logical thinking, but then there's a limbic system underneath that that's down there, where probably the fumes are, it's, and it, it's underneath where this takes over, and you got left brain, right brain, type A, all that stuff, but the brain, and so this thinking and feeling, they work together, and that's why when clients get out of their head, and oh, with I'm yours, I'm going, okay, you're in your head a lot, it's really good, you're an engineer, you're a consultant, you're good, that's good, it works for you, done it, yeah, and I can see, I answer the questionnaire, I mean, it's very, very linear, I get that, I get that, we will, we will keep you in your comfort zone, you know, well, I go, it'll make more sense later, but, but I'll get homework and say, now when you do this homework, when you do this inquiry, do yourself a favor. Give your head some space, let you, and, and, but, but talk to your heart. See what your heart says. And when the gremlin, saboteur, that bad programming comes up and says, oh, don't go there, don't go there, I'll say, tell it, thank you, because it is protecting you. But I said, don't let it block you from going into your heart. I said, I think if you go into your heart, just try it, and then we'll talk. And all the things that open up. So thinking, feeling, I think those go together. Playing and working, in, in this training, this philosophy, they go together. It's like playing and working together. Well, I agree with Confucius. If you love what you do, you'll never work another day in your life. I am here, and I've got a late drive going back, and I knew I'd have a late drive going back. And it's not about just loving to hear myself talk, because, again, I interrupt people. But it's, if I can impart something that helps you build a little more trust and interest in your clients, that helps them reach their goals, that helps make the world a better place, then I'm glad I'm here. I want to be here. So to me, this is play. This is fun. And I only get to do it 10 or 15% of the time. That's probably why I'm going to retire next year. And I got these Coach Mark Stamper. I got them on my own website, my own practice, a few clients. And I got these here. And if you have someone in Indiana, send them my way. Playing and working. But my, my, my wellness client, 90% work, 10% play. 90, 10. And that's great when you're charging up the wheel, when you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, maybe 50s. But 50s start changing. This person's 50. And so they're up here and work once more. And now, because there's diabetes and high blood pressure and 25 extra pounds, it's like, and I go, sounds like you might fall off that. We use teeter-totter, metaphor. Might not fall off. Yeah. And I said, now if you fall off, you might get really hurt. Yeah. And I don't want to do that. So plenty of working. Communicating, talk about that, interpersonal. Intimacy, talk about that. That's one of the dimensions of wellness, intimacy. And not just sexual. Intimacy, being really intimate with ourselves, with other people. And then finding meaning. Oh, finding meaning. And meaning is all this stuff. Finding meaning about what life is, what living of life, the living of life. I tell my students, I'll tell you, we could have, you could have paid me $100 per person to come. Next time I come, I think we should do that. But you could have paid. <laughs> My students pay for my classes. My clients pay. But it's not just about the money and checking off that we completed some for the two CEUs. Time. We can never get this time back again that we had together. And I know I've done most of the talking, and I've thrown a lot of stuff at, at you. 
but we'll never have this time again. And the meaning that we get out of living the life in the moment is the, one of the most important things. Because from that, then we go to transcendence. Now, I like spirituality in the place of transcendence, but transcendence is, it gets to that place where, you know, the client, the big A, what do I really want? I want to climb the mountain, I want to write the book. I had a client, I've been here 50 years, I want to do the bucket list. We did the bucket list for the 50th year. Oh, was that fun and exciting. They got eight out of 10 done. It was so great, we shared, I got to share with that. It's it got pictures, it was so great. Transcendence. Okay. Home stretch. Home stretch. Murray, am I still doing okay? Oh, not really. I better hurry up. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Uh, four things. Four things. The last three are not long. Well, I don't know. But this one. Okay. <laughs> I want to I leave you with this poem from the content. And then, then we got a raffle. I brought, it, I brought something really special. It's going to raffle off. I got some business cards. I don't have to take them, but, but I got them there. And then I've got a final time. I've got a poem. I'm going to leave you the poem by Ruth Center. And it's entitled, If I Really Cared. If I Really Cared. If I Really Cared, who you are would be more important to me than who I am. Where you hurt would be more important than that I'm well. What you feel would be more important than what I know. I'd look you in the eyes and you talk to me. <laughs> I think about what you're saying rather than what I'm going to say next. I hear your feelings as well as your words. I listen without defending. I hear without deciding whether you are right or wrong. I'd ask you why and how, not just when you're there. I'd allow you inside me. I tell you my hopes, my dreams, my fears, my hurts. I tell you when I've blown it and when I've made it. I laugh with you, with you, but not at you. I talk with you and not to you, and I know when it's time to do neither. I wouldn't climb over your walls. I'd wait till you let me in the gate. I wouldn't unlock your secrets. I'd wait till you hand me the key. I'd leave my solutions at home. I'd put away my scripts. The performances were in. If I really cared about you, I'd be myself with you and give you the right to be the same.